Well, I, I want to thank both Gloria and Kathy. Kathy and I have worked together for several years now. Um, she tells a very funny story of how I ruined her life um, when I went into her feed room, <laughs> read her the labels of the feed she was using. And Gloria, I only know by reputation, and I'm just thrilled. I've been looking forward to this for two weeks to actually oh, meet her. Mm -hmm. So, um, my first question is for Gloria, and it's basically to give all of us who are listening and watching um, an, a, a little understanding of traditional Chinese medicine and Chinese herbs. Can you give us a brief overview? Well, Chinese medicine encompasses several modalities. It's acupuncture, treatment with needles, herbal medicine with treatment with herbs, there's bodywork type activities that go on with that. We kind of call that acupressure now. More traditional name for it is called Tui Na, which is uh, a little more vigorous uh, kind of work. And so those are the three main pillars of, of Chinese medicine. We also talk about lifestyle and diet included in that as well. So it's, it's kind of an all encompassing um, umbrella for lifestyle and, and taking care of yourself and your horse. Uh, your horse, so. Okay. Yeah. How is Chinese herbology different from Western herbology? Well, Chinese medicine is a, a little more uh, complex system. It's actually pretty modular and linear when you, when you learn about it. At first, it sounds rather convoluted and kind of confusing, but we have uh, distinctive categories in which we fit herbs. There's taste, temperature, action, where it goes in the body. Um, and then Western medicine, and I, I kind of, uh, I'm cautious about saying Western medicine because lots of cultures have their, their own indigenous form of herbal usage and medicine. So, um, and they're all, they all are very effective and they all have their amazing things that they do and amazing tools to offer. Um, Western medicine, is a little more singular in terms of its um, effects. It, it looks at a herb for a function. Mm -hmm. Chinese medicine, herbalism, tends to look at combinations of herbs to get a function happening. So sometimes people will call me up and say, do you have a good herb for founder? And I'll say, well, whoa, this is a big complex issue. But we have formulas, multiple players in a grouping of that can, can work with this problem. So let's talk about it and then let's direct those herbs, you know, by combining them in certain ways and directing them to the areas of the body that need some help. Whereas sometimes, oh, uh-huh. What I was gonna say is, isn't that because the one of the fundamentals of Chinese medicine is looking at the body system as it relates, as everything relates to itself. In Western medicine, we tend to say, okay, there's an ulcer, so we need to treat the ulcer, not looking at the corresponding body systems that are affected by the ulcer. Yes, it's a little more individualized, focused approach. And Chinese medicine kind of takes a little bit bigger picture. And that's, a, that's part of our questioning, that when we, we look at a human or we look at a horse, we look at multiple things, like what acupuncture points are sensitive? Where are they? Are they on certain meridians? Are they on certain pathways of the body are there you know does the body feel hot does the body feel cold is there sensitivity here how, how does the body smell what does it look like is it dry is it damp you know so we look at all of those factors and then we start pulling a formula together that address addresses each one of those things and so the the other key kind of component to chinese medicine is look at taste temperature function you know so we look at if we've got a fever we've got something's too hot we want to cool that down if we've got something that's too dry we want to moisten that up and nourish it a little bit um, if you've got something that's too wet we want to dry it up so we and then we have different flavors you know that that perform different functions and so um it's kind of an interesting modular system once you kind of get the hang of looking at it in a slightly different lens than right. just you know looking at oh my gosh we've got an ulcer here what are we what are we going to put there so right. okay yeah. um there are the three treasures in 
in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, how do they relate to horse health and well-being? Three treasures are kind of the key to life. Um, and so it's Jing, Qi, and Shen. Uh, the Jing, and I call that our, our health bank account. I don't know if I said that, but that's our, no. we're always <laughs> looking to keep good money and good funds in our bank account. So our health bank account has these factors. So we're always looking at nourishing, replenishing, and preserving. Um, and it's pretty much for any life form, humans, horses, our dogs, our cats, we've all got those, those things. So the, the Jing is what you're born with. It's your DNA, it's your genetic endowment, and you only have so much, and you don't want to overuse it. It has a lot to do with our, our development, is fetuses and humans, um, our longevity, uh, our disease potential, it's the stuff we get from mom and dad that we're just, that those are just the cards we're dealt. Okay. You, um, and then we have our chi, which is our, we kind of, you know, we call it life force, we call it energy, we call it those things. I look at it as the functionality, oh. the mobility, the immunity of the body in general. It gets a little, um, people talk about the chi and it gets a little bit out there for most folks. Um, and I that might be just sort of a little bad translation from Chinese into European languages into English. So we, but we're always looking at preserving our chi, building our chi. It drives what we are. It's the pilot light under our stove. You know, we want that you click on the stove. You want that propane to go boosh, you know, and it's heating the cauldron. It's heating the stove. It's baking your food. You know, it's keeping your house warm. That's how I, I, I like to look at the chi. Okay. And then our shen is our cognitive functions, our emotional stability, our spirit, our spiritual life, our connection with the great beyond. You know? So it's, those are the things we like to hold and preserve. And when one is not optimal, the others suffer. In the case of ulcers, what would be a... Um... Of the three treasures, are you looking at an imbalance of chi or an imbalance of shen or imbalance of both of them? You know, it's a combo platter, um, as many in Chinese medicine are. Yeah. <laughs> it's never the black or white answer. Sometimes it's 20% of this, 10% of that, you know, another 70% of this thing. So when I look at ulcers, I look at a, a condition of excess. You've got excessive inflammation, you've got heat, you've yeah. got mental disturbances, not only because you're in pain, and that's keeping you from thinking and functioning well, but it all, you know, chi, and, and pain eats up your chi. You know, I, I work with a lot of chronic pain patients, and they're just depleted. They're brain foggy, they can't think. It's, it's a challenge. But once you get their pain dialed down, their shen starts to get happy again. So we, and we see this with our horses. And then, you know, then let's talk about the chi factor. Okay. If you're, if you've got this excess heat and inflammation, too much acid, you don't have enough mucosal protection and lining, you're not digesting well. It's making you grumpy, fearful, unpleasant, you're in pain. You're also not digesting well. So all of that food is not getting processed into the chi that becomes the rest of your body. So that's where you lose your condition, that's where you get bad health, it's, you get muscle, kind of muscle loss. So it's kind of this perfect storm of loss of the treasures. And so where do we start for dialing that down, dialing down that excess, rebuilding that, that substantive quality, which we call the yin aspect. That's right. a whole other medicine discussion. Um, <laughs> So how do we do that? And we, you know, we can do that with acupuncture. We can do that with herbs. We certainly do that with supplements. We certainly do that with diet um, and lifestyle, good exercise. And here we are back, you know, at the three treasures again. So, um, from a a traditional Chinese medicine perspective, how does the formation of a stomach ulcer affect the body system at large? What other organs are involved? 
Well, we, and we touched on that a tiny bit already. Yeah. Um, if your stomach and di overall digestive functions aren't working well, that chi that's derived from the food that, and the water and the vitamins and supplements that the body is taking in, into the stomach and into the large intestine, aren't being utilized, aren't being delivered where they need to go. And so you start to see other systems starting to get impeded. So it, it starts to become like this trickle down effect of a cascade of problems and degeneration. So that would include the immune system, the liver, the kidneys. Right. Clean. So how, how do you see, or do you see a difference between uh, gastric ulcers and hindgut ulcers from a traditional Chinese medicine perspective? Or are they just happening in different parts of the GI tract and they're essentially the same thing? There's similar pathologies happening in what we call the, the Yang Ming system of the body, which um, we, we have sort of a difficult time with translation. We, we call um, you know, the stomach meridian, the spleen meridian, the large intestine meridian, but those meridians are paired into groups. And that's the older way of thinking about, uh, about the body systems. That's a little bit more classic Chinese thinking. So you're, you're afflicting the whole, what we call the Yang Ming aspect of the body. So you've not, you're, you not only are you not processing your food in the beginning, um, you're not able to absorb and utilize out through the large intestine, because that's sort of the last stop before yeah. you know, things are being absorbed and minerals and water and everything from your food is getting kind of taken back out into the system. So the stomach's breaking it down and right. getting it started, chopping it up. It's the kitchen, you know, and we've cooked it and sauteed it. The food processor is what I like to think about it. <laughs> yeah, the food processor is, is like, you know, getting it word up and it's, it's moist and meaty and lovely and now it's moving on down the pathway. It's going to get out, it's going to get distributed. All the last little nutritive bits get processed out in the large intestine. And if you've got too much dryness in a large intestine, if you don't have enough mucosal lining, things don't, things don't process there well. So there you've taken your chi factory and you've really dialed the whole thing down. So that's, it, it affects everybody. Everybody's yeah. being supported by that. And so everybody else isn't getting their chi. I love the fact everybody's got a pet. <laughs> that's really sweet. How do you get, well, I think you've sort of answered this, how gastric ulcers and hindgut ulcers affect chi. And well, and they also affect your shen a little bit. Okay, so that you, would make sense. So the, the grumpy, um, unhappy horse is showing us the imbalance of shen. Shen disturbed, you shen know? Disturbed. Are there, what are other, some other signs for horse owners to look at that maybe the shen is imbalanced? Well, um, fearfulness, worry, um, not being able to focus on your hor the horse or rider. You know, there's a lot of those kinds of, you know, there's a degree of shen disturbances and entire books have been written about this in Chinese medicine from, from the extreme person who talks to themselves walking down the street you know, that they're, they're having a conversation, that's an extreme form of shen disturbance, to somebody who is just super cranky down and irritable and having a rotten day and they're grumpy and mad. So that's on the mild end and then there's the, you know, the extreme end of the person who's having a conversation, you know, with someone and else. The there. imbalance is probably not exactly shen, but it's qi and what's behind the, di the disruption in qi, which then sets off shen. It, it's, a, it's a contributor. You know, sometimes we have that where we, we talk about, um, you know, there's 20% this, 30% that, 50% something else. So that you kind of have to dial the gauge a little bit and say, oh, you know, there may be about 40% 40, 40 shen disturbance happening here as opposed to like localized pain. Uh, you know, coming from the large intestine, which is, is a chi stagnation. You know, it's a focal point of chi stagnation. So okay. where there's 
inflammation, there's pain. And then very often where there's pain, there's shen disturbance too. Ah, okay, okay. Um, what is the relationship between the stomach and spleen? I mean, what I've been reading in this massive book, spleen seems to come up a lot. And I, I don't think I've even heard a veterinarian talk about uh, equine spleen. So can you kind of translate this? Well, we, in classic kind of Chinese thinking, the stomach, like we talked about a little bit before, is the food processor that's right. worrying up and it's getting cooked in the kitchen. The spleen, um, you know, back in the olden days, our, our doctors of old had a little bit different interpretation about organs and organ systems and organ functions. And so they, they spoke about them in slightly different ways. So we look at the spleen, we call that transportation, transport and tra transportation of the food and the minerals and things going out into the body. So the stomach processes it, it's a more yang chi function. The spleen is a little bit more friendly, moisture, nourishing function, making sure that all of those nutrients go out to all the far extremities. Spleen also looks at musculature. It, it, it is the organ most affected by worry and pensiveness. So if you're reading that book, <laughs> your giant book, yes. you're gonna have spleen deficiency. So be sure to like go out and walk, move your big muscles. The spleen loves exercise. The okay. spleen does dampness, so eat a little bit warmer, drier foods. Don't study in too long of periods because you'll kind of deplete your spleen energy a little bit. It happens when you're a student. It just does. Well, but how does that relate to a horse that is oh, out moving around and moving your bodies, or, um, or or is when they're stalled or confined, is that yeah. automatically putting pressure on? the spleen meridian. It can, yes, because they're not moving their big muscle groups. So the, did, did you hear the part I said about the spleen and the pancreas being together? No. Okay, so let me go back to that. I'm sorry, I don't know where you lost me. So back in the olden days, the old doctors looked at the spleen in terms of its functionality as, it, as opposed to just the organ. So the spleen, and the pancreas are partnered together in the body. They're very, very close to each other. They kind of hold each other. So the spleen and pancreas are one in Chinese medicine thinking. So when we think about what does the pancreas do, insulin, glucose metabolism, yeah. we need to move our sugar into the musculature of our bodies. Insulin does that. That's the friend of the pancreas. So spleen has a much broader digestive enabling function than what we think of the Western spleen, which is just sort of a storage organ for white blood cells right. and immunity. So the, the spleen, we should say spleen pancreas partnership is that function of spleen stomach in Chinese medicine. Gotcha. So yeah, glucose movement regulation um, nourishing the mus the musculature because the spleen is in charge of muscles. So like the, the gastric ulcer. Mm -hmm. How is that going to affect the horse's ability to move its muscles vis-a-vis -vis support from the spleen? Um, I think in terms of gastric ulcers, there's just more pain happening there. Okay. Okay. We do. In my formulas that we, for gastric support, I always put in spleen tonics and spleen support. That's gotcha. just because it's part of the overall digestive picture. Right. So I add those in just to support the spleen because if, you're, if you've got a gastric ulcer, your spleen is probably pissed off and mad too. So <laughs> not only your stomach, but your spleen is, your, your Chinese spleen is irritated too. <laughs> And we look at horses that are, are very ulcery, you know, they put their little ears back, they get that worried look on their face, they get stressed. That, uh, that's an emotion that affects the spleen as well, that worry factor. Okay. You know, nervous, I'm worried, kind of pensive thing that they do. Kathy. Kathy? 
Yes. <laughs> what do horses' muscles tell you about ulcers? Okay, I don't know if you can hear me because I'm in the middle of a really big storm right now. <laughs> we actually can hear you. Okay, good, because I was having a hard time hearing Gloria. Um, it's interesting to hear Gloria's descriptions and what she finds when she goes to see horses. And she kind of describes some of the things that um, typically that are presented to me. And, you know, sometimes people call me in to look at a horse because it's having some behavioral issues and they want to know, they always want to know, is it something physical or is it emotional? <laughs> and um, so I often, those horses, I often try to go in just kind of blind and see if I can pick up on anything on the muscles. I actually had one today. I actually literally had one today come to me, ask me to come and look at the horse. And uh, she described some of the emotional stuff that Gloria was just talking about. She said, the first thing she said, well, be careful going in his stall because he won't let you touch it. And I thought, well, there's a good sign right there. <laughs> That's not always the case, but oftentimes when people say that, I just kind of think, okay, well, that's curious because that's not normally their nature. So what I find most often with horses that have some kind of a stomach ulcer is um, the, you know, the deep pectoral muscles posterior, which would mean the girth area, kind of down along the sternum and kind of the muscle that runs along the side where your girth would go, those areas become very tight and very sensitive. And one of the questions I always ask the, the you know, rider trainer is how are they about tightening the girth? That's a huge tip off. And they'll typically with these horses, they say, yeah, they don't like the girth. We do it slowly. We have a padded girth. So I go, to those areas with my hands and just kind of palpate those muscles and they're really reactive on those muscles meaning they not only do the muscles feel tight but they really do have an emotional reaction to that area and wow. you know that to me is those are the muscles that they're holding themselves yeah kind of those are their holding muscles those muscles hold the trunk so um, sometimes it can be confused with feet, but typically uh, a girth area being tight is almost always an ulcerated horse. How about the back? Uh, okay, wait, this is a good segue. So Angela has asked um, if pain on other parts of the body, for example, back pain can cause ulcers. Uh, I have never found that. I, in my experience, long-term ulcers cause the back pain. In my experience. That's always like a, one of the long-term side effects, muscle-wise, of an ulcery horse. Gloria? You know, it's just interesting what Kathy just mentioned, because when I got to visit Kathy this spring, in Florida, we came across some horses that had a lot of indentation in the lumbar area. And, and Kathy said, oh, these guys are kind of old. And that was just clicking in my mind when she said that long-term radiating effect. But also, that's, there's the large intestine points are back in that area on the horse's back, but also, you know, the intestine runs back through there too. So that's just kind of an interesting correlation. I, I only have observed it like a couple times when you pointed it out, but I, I think that's interesting. Well, and one of the examples I would give is, um, I work on um, some yearlings that are prepped for uh, sale. And, and, you know, Marie will 
she's a small breeder and she, she, her program is very different than this. Um, but she'll understand this, that, that, you know, I'll be called in to help with some of the yearlings. Of course, it's hard for them because they're now being put in their stalls during the day, hand walk, turned out at night, the schedule changes. And I got called in on a horse last year, a filly last year, and they had had a lot of other work done. And I walked in and they said, oh, it's back sore, it's back sore. And the first thing I did was I ran my hand down uh, the deep pectoral muscle, kind of sternum area, and the filly almost flipped over backwards. Wow. And that, and as I palpated her more, it was clear that her, uh, she had some um, pretty extreme ulcers, and they all were pointing to her back. And I didn't even, I did no body work on the, on the filly. I said to them, what you need to do is address the stomach. And if you address the stomach, that the back is going to go away. And, you know, they begged me and I said, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. It needs to have the stomach addressed. So sure enough, they address the stomach. I come back the next week and already within one week, the back was better. So that's kind of an example of some oftentimes I find that scenario um, that it's, you know, it's easier to focus on that area. So. Emily, I noticed there's another question that just came up. Yes. And it's kind of a hefty one. <laughs> so it says, can severe long-term ulcers be addressed with just herbs and body work or are there times when drugs are necessary? Hmm. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I'm not a veterinarian. <laughs> Hashtag, I'm not a veterinarian. But sometimes you need a little help getting over the bump. Yeah. And sometimes you need to work and pick and pick what tools you want to use. And I think we live in a time where we have the opportunities to pick what tools we want to use. And it, maybe it's a trial and error thing for people to say, maybe, because I know Kathy has talked to me about horses that have been on GastroGuard and some of the ulcer meds help them transition away from those drugs into good supplements from Tigger, herbs, diet, things like that have, have really helped those horses transition away. But I know sometimes people need to use a little shot of GastroGuard every once in a while just to get them over a bad weekend. Um, well, I'm not a veterinarian either. Yeah. Um, but I always, when I, in my world, when I find something like that, I always refer them to the veterinarian. And usually one of the things I recommend is have the horse scoped. Um, because, you know, then you, you know what you're dealing with. And it's hard to it's hard to make a program if they're, if, if they're chronic, if the horse has been like that a long time and they're presenting in that way, that having the horse scope really seems to give you a better plan moving forward. I've had people address them a multitude of ways. I've had people address them with just a diet change, um, some of the Biostar supplements, and that seems to turn them around. I've had some people have to add in the herbs, and then I've also had other people that have had to do a 30-day um, with some of the, you know, heavier meds. It just depends on you, you've got to you've got to see what's going on in the stomach. In, in my opinion, that's that's what I that's been my experience. That every horse is a little different. And starting with scoping the stom stomach seems to, you know, if it's a long-term thing, lets you know what you have. And I will add that it, it's becoming more and more important to know if you're dealing with squamous ulcers or you're dealing with glandular gastric ulcers. Because a meprazole really doesn't work on glandular ulcers. And you need another powerhouse like misoprostol or sucralate or something 
and they can take the longest time to heal. Squamous is pretty straightforward. Um, it's in the upper portion of the stomach. And generally, of course, a gastric guard will take care of it. Glandular is way more tricky. And it's, it seems, or it appears to me, that um, performance horses and sport horses are having more glandular ulcers than, than um, squamous and they're taking a lot longer to heal. I, I, I'm not talking about weeks, I'm talking about four months, six months, eight months. And that's why scoping becomes so important, especially if you're dealing with glandular, then you can treat for four, four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks and go back and rescope and see where they are. You know, if they were a grade four, are they at least a grade one or a grade two maybe? Or have they cleared up entirely? So I agree with Kathy that scoping is, is a really important tool. And for the hind gut, since you can't scope, it's really important to get the ultrasound. Oh, we have another question. Yes, so Marie said, is the differentiation determined by scoping? About where the ulcer is? Yes. The upper portion of the stomach, which is the third, top third, is squamous. The, the, the remainder two thirds to the pyloric is glandular. And you can see them on, on scoping. Does that answer your question? You said you answered the question, but also mentioned ultrasound. Ultrasound for the hind gut. You can't scope the hind gut. It's too far away. No scope is gonna get back that far. So generally uh, what veterinarians do is they bring out an ultrasound, they ultrasound the right dorsal colon and that they get a, a measurement of inflammation there for hind gut ulcers. Um, Kathy, what are some of your tips for managing the ulcer prone horse? Can I add something to the difference between uh, the question that Marie asked? Can I add something to that? Of course. As far as some of the muscling that I see. Yeah. At, uh, the external oblique muscle, which comes off the tuber cocci or point of hip, comes down and attaches down under the sternum, you know, kind of the abdomen area. Typically, if horses are hind gut ulcer, that muscle is really tight and they're very sensitive in that flank area. You'll almost see a little depression there and almost a ridge where the external oblique comes off and wraps around the uh, abdominal area and attaches down at the sternum. So that's something I did want to add that when I'm working on horses, sometimes I find both. Sometimes I find those girth area muscles tight and then as I'm working on them, I'll find sternal oblique will be very tight and very sensitive. And that's when I do say, you may want to scope the horse, you may want to do an ultrasound to kind of determine what you're dealing with. So I did want to add that for people, but that is something that's, um, you know, that I see a lot when it is hind gut ulcer and they do the ultrasound and confirm that. So that is, that, I thought that would be helpful for people also. Yes. And what was the other question, Tigger? So what are your tips for managing the ulcer prone horse? Well, you know, typically what I, what I ask people is what are you feeding them? That's kind of the first question I ask them. But like, what, what is the horse eating? And, um, and how much hay is the horse getting? You know, I usually go straight to the diet and, you know, whether the horse is on the farm or, um, you know, I know, and Marie will know this, when the grass comes up in Kentucky, they get gassy and you got to give them a flake of hay, even if they're out all the time. You know, it becomes a real management issue, but at the horse shows or any competitions on the road, that's the first question I ask them is, you know, what is, what is the diet look like? And I think you can talk more about that and you've taught me more about that. And, and um, you know, I asked him the question about uh, the hay, but for me, um, 
I've seen so many horses, um, you know, get better just through the diet change, uh, which gives the owner the power to affect a change on their horse's health. That's what's really kind of exciting about that. And it is a little complicated and you can talk about that Tigger and you taught me that. And yeah, you did ruin my life when you came into my grain room and taught me to read labels. And I do see that there, there's a lot of fillers in the commercial feeds and um, you know, that kind of a cleaner diet, a more whole food diet, seems to help them very quickly. Now, it doesn't resolve, you know, a main issue, but it gives them comfort immediately. Yeah. And so that's typically one of the things that I, um, you know, kind of give them suggestions on, because I'm on the ground, I'm on the front line with them, in the moment with them, and we talk about the diet change, and the other thing I kind of steer them in the direction to because, you know, you and I have done some beta testing is, you know, some of the new things that you've come out with. And in just in the last week here, we've had tremendous response with your new TriGuard. The stomach case has given horses relief immediately in the moment while you're trying to kind of come up with a, a, a plan moving forward to, to help them heal, but that seems to give them instant relief. So the biggest thing for me is really, you know, what are they feeding them, um, how much hay they're getting, and especially the hay through the night, especially yeah. that time between night check and the morning, you know, to keep something in front of them during those hours seems to be good. So that's, that's kind of my, that's, that's where I start with people uh, to help them manage that. Emily, I saw a question pop up. Yeah, so these are some good questions. So, you know, not all horses can be in 24 seven turnout with free choice hay, grass, um, no, you know, conventional grains. So what can you do to help them? And then the other question is, how do you build up the good mucosa um, in gut that has been ulcerated? And then, it, this is Catherine Olden Creamer. Can I just break in quickly and say that environmental question I asked? My yes, mare lives yes. that now. So I wanna know, and we're, we're still struggling with ulcers, and I wanna know where I can go beyond that. She has 24 seven, she's out in a field with friends. She has a slow feed hay net. She's not on grain. She gets a, her supplements, she's on all of it. And I've reached, um, I'm trying to keep her from retirement due to fear caused by pain. So I'm here to see if there's more, what more can I be doing than what everyone says you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> And I'm happy to throw my video on. Sorry. <laughs> Kathy? You want me to answer that? Please. You, and, and then we'll have Gloria. Well, it's an interesting phenomenon. I think Marie understands that because she raises babies. Same thing. Why do foals have ulcers, right? Like, why is that? I don't know the answer to that question. Again, I'm not a veterinarian. I do know that... Um, some of the supplements that you've come up with, Tigger, seem to really help those horses that seem to be prone to um, the ulcers. I mean, I have some people who have retired horses that live out in the field that just, they get ulcery and they put them on the, you know, the optimum GI, which is your lower level uh, stomach supplement that seems to do it. And if they need uh, something more, I like to say, I like to add the Theracom because that, that addresses, the thing I like about the Theracom is, and you've taught me this, it, it addresses the adrenals and, and Gloria, you talked about the emotions of it and that's where that Theracom seems to quiet the adrenals so the body is not just shooting cortisol and poisoning it itself basically. So 
the combination of those two, I, like I said, I have some retired horses, they just live on it. And that seems to help them manage their ulcery stomach. Um, and I know that I've worked with Gloria with some other herbs we've done, and I, I know that's helped also. So that's, that's what I know. Gloria? No, you guys dropped out a little bit, so I'll hop in for what I heard. But if I'm repeating my, tell me. Um, Kathy touched on a, a, a topic about the calming the shen and all that. Um, yeah. There are herbs that do actually calm the shen. There's a category of Chinese herbs referred to as shen calmers. Um, the one in particular that I like to use is one called Swan Zhao Ren. Um, it's a lovely herb, it does multiple things, but it, it does kind of help anchor that fear and nervousness and worry, kind of help alleviate that. It also helps you bond oxygen onto your hemoglobin, so it's very, very good for horses that are working out and trying to build up their respiratory, you know, oomph, like leaders and uh, thoroughbreds and that sort of thing, or if you're going up to high altitude, like like me, I go up into the mountains with my horses and camp up at you know high altitude of, in the Sierra. And so I always give them a little handful of um, Swanzo Ren and a few other things in there. And they're very mellow and laid back by the time we get where we're going. But, <laughs> and the lady who had asked the question previously about what, you know, what can you do to build up your mucosal lining and that sort of thing, um, there are herbs that are yin tonic -y herbs and herbs that help engender more of that mucosal development so in in your you know in your formulas as well um so what i do with mine is you know we talked about the combination of things um so when i'm working with ulcer formulas i have things that help dial down the acid um, calcium rich herbs i also use some calcinated herbs there's one called muli which is quite beautiful um, it is it's, it's very high in um, calcium. It's a powdered shell, and that helps dial down the acid so you're not getting that. It's like, it's like a Tums, but not a Tums. Um, and then we've got some things that cool heat, take down the inflammation, which, you know, is caused from that excess of acid. But that here's the Shen component coming back in again. We have to calm that Shen down and help anchor that Shen with some heavier herbs that help ground and bring that down. So here's that um, gradient range of, you know, 20% here, 30% here, you know, a little bit here. And you can play with those balances. So perhaps the lady who had asked the question about, you know, she's do, it sounds like she's doing beautiful things with lifestyle and hay and supplementation and your supplements and things. Maybe what part of that missing component might be a little bit of that Shen anchoring calming factor you know, throw a little bit of that into the program for her little horse too. Would um, it be possible to put the name of those herbs up in the chat so that we could um, write them down or would Emily be able to do that? Um, do, 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 I can. Oh, Here, you actually have a formula, don't you? Gloria? I do. What I don't have is a way for me to like share my screen with you guys. I'm using my iPad, so I don't have all that information right in front of me. Is there, like, could I send you a screenshot or something? Or could I hold up the label? That'd be awesome. <laughs> that would work. <laughs> I have a notebook. <laughs> or maybe, Gloria, just put the name of the formula on the chat with your website. Yeah, wholehorse.com is Gloria's oh, website. That's, mm -hmm. thank you, Kathy. You're thinking ahead. <laughs> but I, hold up the formula also so they can see it. So, okay, let me do this. Is that wait, there? Oops. That's good. Oops. That's good. Yeah. Perfect. So if anybody wants to take a screenshot of that, they can, I guess. And then um, it's my gastric support formula. And then um, let me see if I can figure out how to do that um, for my. I'm trying to figure out a way to do the chat on here because I. Um, I think somebody already shared it, Gloria. Somebody shared your uh, link. Oh, Lindsay, oh, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Lindsay thank shared you, Lindsay. your link. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Lindsay. I'm just going to add that um, when uh, this webinar is over, 
just for your information, Gloria will do custom blends. So if you want to have a consultation with her, you can contact her via email from her website and set up a consultation. And she can actually make a, a uh, Chinese uh, herbal blend just for your horse. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, herbs is something I love to do. So you can call me. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, are your herbal blends show? Are they what you kept? Soak plant. Yes. Okay. I, did you, I thought you said soak plant. No, show compliant. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. And, and we soak plants too. Yes. <laughs> you know, technology is not always our friend, and today it's a little rocky. <laughs> okay. So, Gloria and Kathy, what role does acupressure and body work play in the management of ulcers? The body work is secondary to the stomach issue. So if you don't address the stomach issue, the body work isn't going to go anywhere. In my opinion, you, that you either need to address it through Gloria's herb or Tigger's supplement to give the horse some relief or you're just, I, I often don't work on horses that are chronic ulcers. I often bounce them to the vet or whoever. And once, once that is being treated, then I can give the horse some relief. So I'm kind of the secondary person. Okay. Gloria is really the one you would start with. Well, and to, I have to say something that I've learned some amazing things from Kathy and I have to say that we're evolving our practices all the time. And Kathy has done a lot of work with Dr. Kane's um, diagnostic points. And when I am privileged enough to get to hang out and visit with her a little bit, she shows me things and I'm like, dang, look at that. Oh my gosh, check that out. Look at this correlation with this thing. And so I love how she's progressed. She's kind of moved our medicine forward in a very positive way. Yeah. And so we're, we're always learning and evolving and Chinese medicine is always evolving. And I'm really you know grateful for that. Um, and so one of the things you know I would look at is if we, if you want a little bit of of assistant gut health with your horses, you could definitely do some acupressure type work. And so one of the things that I've done is I use a little bit different system, of a little bit older system. Um, in, in America, we learn something called TCM, which is a little bit newer version of Chinese medicine. It's been around since like 1930, so it's not old, old. But there are other systems by which this TCM system is based on that um, are pretty powerful. So I've done a little bit of translating some of that into horse uh, anatomy. And so there's a little bit different regions you can do uh, and work on. And it certainly could help, help your horse um, doing some work on some of the points. And, you know, say if you've got heat and inflammation in the stomach, you might want to do some acupressure up by the horse's elbow on the large intestine meridian, uh, which, and there's a, there's a region there called large intestines gate. And why not massage that? And the other, the point up on the elbow actually is good for any itis. And inflammation is an itis, sinusitis, colitis, you know, uveitis. These are all inflammation conditions. Gastritis, you know, that's another ulcer-like condition. So go to that point and it's, it's easy and it's safe to do because the horse can't really kick at you or bite at you too easily. And get in there and massage, that, massage those points. That could be a helper right there. Um, we also use those points diagnostically. It's like Kathy was discussing earlier, you know, she talked about going you know, in the girth area along near the midline of the horse. That's where the stomach meridian goes. And 
you can run your hands under there and if horses are reactive in some of those areas chances are you've got some heat or pain going on within that stomach meridian within that stomach system and so uh, the body will tell you some things you may not have to get in there and do a lot of heavy massage work and really grinding to, you know, to work you can do some gentler acupressure and that takes us back to one of those foundation pillars of the stool for Chinese medicine, which was the Twina massage acupressure. So those are some tools that horse owners can learn to utilize on their own horses. And they're simple to use, simple to learn. Um, and those could be some things people could implement on their own too. Don't you have an acupressure chart on your website that you sell? I've got, I've got a free one for digestive conditions. If you sign up, newsletter you automatically get one in the mail and if oh, anybody wow. this and they want one just email me and I'll send you a PDF in, um, on on email and you can have you can have one to play with but I do sell charts for different conditions kind of the more popular the more popular ones so Gloria can I write your email in the chat sure you can always send it to me in my comments section on my website. Sorry, I had technical difficulty today too with my email address. So it's CV, I'm sorry, it's cvacupuncture.com. Office at cvacupuncture.com. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, do we have another question before I bring in our final question? Um, Kate asked, how long on average does it take for herbs to be effective in managing ulcers? Oh my goodness. You know, I generally, to be safe, tell people give it a week to two weeks until you get a good loading dose in your system and it's had a time to take effect. But very often I have people call me up and say, you know, three and four days in, horses are already feeling better. So but I like to give myself a little latitude because people, if you're not doing handsprings the minute you walk out from a treatment, people think it's not effective. So I always cut myself a little leeway in there. But generally speaking, it, it can happen quicker. Emily, I saw another question pop up. Can I jump in on that, Tigger? Yeah, please. Um, I also want to add in that your new product, Theragard, which you developed for treatment of ulcers. Yeah. Um, we are seeing results in two or three days on some horses with the Theragard powder if you use the, uh, the recommended dose, which is uh, one scoop twice a day. But we've had some, I've had some horses within days are getting relief on that. So I just wanted to add that in. Thanks. <laughs> that's, that's exciting. It's how wonderful to hear, you know? Yeah, it's, no kidding. It, 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 that product has been over almost a year and a half in beta testing on so many difficult ulcer horses. So it, it, it's, um, it's really exciting now that it's, it's available because we know from the beta testing and from the scoping of some of the beta test horses just what it can do. And it incorporates some of traditional Chinese medicine via the mushrooms. Oh, very good. Yeah. I love that. See, another beautiful tool for the toolbox. I yeah, love that. exactly. Um, Emily, I saw two more questions, I think, or at least yeah. one. Um. Do you want to finish your final question and then keep okay. okay, okay. So my final question is, ta-da, drum roll. What have ulcer horses taught you? Gloria? Um, that there's always ways to improve your formulas. And, <laughs> and keep growing and growing. And, uh, you know, just in the last year, I've evolved my formula uh, quite a bit more. And that is based a lot on Kathy's input from the horses that have been using the formulas. So that's been very exciting. So always learning, always growing and keeping our eye on the next target for the next best formula. So Kathy, what have the ulcer horses taught you? 
I think she might have gotten knocked off. I don't see her. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, you want to start opening up the questions? Brenda had one. Yes. Brenda says, how long to treat with ulcer prescriptions for hindgut ulcers? I did three weeks and he was better, then got tight hind muscles again. He does not want to move his hind legs. He's very tight. Um, I'm assuming he was being treated with misoprostol and sucralfate. He was treated with ulcer RX, which not only treats stomach ulcers, but it also treats the hindgut ulcers. You know what it is? Do I know what's in it? Yeah. I, it, I don't I don't have it in front of me. I don't have the medical. Is it a supplement? Not a no, medical. No, 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 it's no, it's like GastroGuard. It actually has more more of the Omeprazole? Yes, in, in it. And it also treats hindgut, where UlcerGuard does not. Right. GastroGuard. GastroGuard. So, so he was better. He was better. He was relaxed. He was moving. He was good. And then um, a couple weeks later, he, he wouldn't move. <laughs> so. And he was still on the formula? No, he was not on the formula. I treated him for like a week in January, you know, a week here. And then I did three weeks. I did three weeks like in May. And he was good. But then he went back and it's, you know, he seems to be in pain again. So do, my question is, do hind ulcers take four to, four to eight months also, like the glandular, or how long do they take to, to clear up? Assuming he's, he came to us like this, so I don't know how long he's been like this. He was a very, very, very tense horse when we got him. So I approach it from, when I'm dealing with a hindgut ulcer, I change the diet, and by that, I mean, I cut the hay, because you want to reduce stress on the hindgut. So hay is very stemmy, it's full of a lot of lignin, so I go with chopped hay, soaked hay cubes, as much pasture as they can have. And I just reduce the really steady hay for a good 30 days. And I substitute chopped hay, soaked hay cubes, hay pellets, anything to give the hindgut a rest. Okay. And I add hemp seed oil. Hemp seed oil has GLA, which is a prostaglandin regulator. So misoprostol, which is a common drug for hindgut ulcers, very effective. It regulates the prostaglandins. So okay. does GLA. So for me, I'll, I'll go with hemp seed oil. Hemp okay. oil doesn't work. It has to be hemp seed oil. That's the source of GLA. So change I the do, diet. I do, I do hemp seed oil <laughs> for myself. In change my the diet for 30 days. Okay. Um, now he's on a very good diet, very anti-inflammatory. He only gets- Yeah, but I'm talking about the hay portion. Yeah, you you're right. He gets very stemmy hay. It's very, in fact, yeah, it's very stemmy. And that changed. That is the thing that should change in the last couple weeks is the stemmy hay. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Okay. I didn't think about that because he gets lots of hay, but I can get him better hay, you know. Reduce the hay. Go with Reduce chopped it. hay. Well, what about alfalfa? Perfect. Okay. Got it. I mean, it can be stemmy too. It's better if it's chopped. It's better if it's soaked hay cubes. It's better if it's pasture. But you're going to do this for a month. Maybe he's going to get two flakes of hay a day, but the rest is going to be this, these other forms of forage. If you can get chaff hay, that would yeah. be the best. Chaff hay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the triple crown. Triple crown makes an alfalfa uh, blend. Yeah, it's not made by Triple Crown, but that's fine. There yeah. is another hay called Chaff Hay. It's a fermented alfalfa. Fresh alfalfa where I am, which, I, which is what I'm feeding my 30-year-old. It's just stemmy. Fresh alfalfa. Again, just remember, alfalfa is stemmy. We're trying to stemmy? reduce okay. the stemmy. Okay, okay. If you have a soft alfalfa, great. Yeah, but, it's pretty soft. It's pretty dusty. It's pretty, like, you know, loose. Okay. So, um, okay, so the chopped hay. All right, good for him, chopped hay, got it. Okay, I'll reduce that, and then you think what? Just Hemp nothing seed. else? What about magnesium? What about magnesium malate? Well, that's really for muscle. I mean, I, if I was gonna use magnesium, I'd be using it for muscles, not for the hindgut. Gloria, do you wanna jump in here? I, I mean, I, I'm doing it from a food perspective. You know, I was 
just listening to you talk about the chafe hay, I've just started using that with my old horses. I've got I two love chafe hay. in their late twenties. Yeah. And you know, we talked about the stomach liking moisture. The chafe hay or chafe hay, I don't know how they quite they say it. It's moist, it's soft, it's yeah. very digestible, it's very palatable. Um, because my old guy's teeth are getting a little, you know, less robust. They like they like the alfalfa, but they leave all the sticks. The chafe, they finish it right down yeah. to the bottom, and they think it's lovely. Yeah. Um, and I have taken my grass hay, and I soak it for 15, 20 minutes in the morning, pour off, pour off the water and the dust. So it's beautiful for the summer because, you know, right now I'm in droughty California where it's hot and dry. And they love that moist, cool, a little bit softer hay. And it's and they don't do the stems, but I, I so I'm totally on board with what you're saying with the with the chafe hay. I think it's beautiful stuff, and it's got all that um, probiotic quality to it. It's sort of like a fermentation product that's on it, mixed in with it, and it comes in a giant bag. It's a like 50 pound block, but it's lovely. It's and they <laughs> every bite, you know, they're licking the feeder. It's it's good. So I, I'm, I'm a fan now for that. Okay. Thank you. Emily? I like hemp seeds too, by the way. I, I feed them. They're just part of my routine as well. They get a scoop of hemp seeds in their, in their mix also. Uh, good stuff. <laughs> the ladies in the office here, we eat them too. <laughs> But you need the concentrated oil for the GLA. I mean, to use it therapeutically. Emily? Megan or Megan says, any difference in your approach to chronic versus acute ulcers? Gloria? I just have my one formula that I use. Um, and you can dial up a little bit more of the heat reducing uh, inflammatory herbs that go into them, like the, the Wong Bai and some of those. Uh, those are very, very good for taking down the heat in the gut quickly. So you can always bump that one up a little bit more. So that's it. And that's a modulation. You know, we have our off the shelf formulas that are general, but if someone calls me and says, you know, I've got an acute problem, I can add more of those heat relievers, anti-inflammatories, you know, as a loading dose in the beginning. Um, there's some herbs in here, and I know this doesn't relate directly to horses, but there are some of the few herbs that actually treat H. pylori, and you know, which is a is an issue for a lot of human beings. And so it's a, but it's a very cooling formula in that way too. So if you think about an acute form, it's heat, inflammation, excess acid. It's on, it's on fire, you know. <laughs> so this is, this is helping to put out the fire herbally, you know. So there's more herbs of quell that, quell that a little more quickly. I hope that, I hope that answered the question. Emily? Um, can you guys talk a little bit more about show compliance with some of these products that we're recommending? There's some herbs that are prohibited and some herbs that, you know, we know they don't test for, and even though I don't create formulas to cheat the tests or anything, um, I try to be extremely careful about what we add into things, uh, just so we, sometimes things are close enough chemically that might mimic something, like licorice has become rather controversial, and licorice is a key player in many Chinese herbal formulas, and just to be safe, I took my licorice out, which makes me sad because it's so effective and so beautiful. But, and I've never had a positive test with licorice, but I said, well, I don't want to, I don't want to get close. So I, I, I took it out. Now, if you have just a horse that lives at home, let me know and I can put licorice in your formula for you. You need it. But for, for the show horses, I don't, I don't do any of that. And knock on wood, I've never had a positive test. So, um, there you go. <laughs> I can say Biostar's ulcer formulas are absolutely sure safe. 
Um, one of the things I think is that hemp seed oil, hemp is kind of a hot topic right now in terms of illegal substances. Okay, so there's no CBD in hemp seed oil. None. Zero. Zip. We have we're, so many horses either, so we're, we're safe. That, yeah. that are on hemp seed oil and they, they don't test because it's not in there. Hemp oil, different story. Hemp seed oil, there is no CBD. Nikki asked, are there any whole feed brands you recommend? Gloria? <laughs> I, I try to kind of mix from scratch and do my own because I'm, I'm a simpler foods kind of person and I've been careful about avoiding soy and avoiding sugars and avoiding additives and I get a little bit nervous about GMOs and um, it doesn't make me a popular gal at my feed store. So I'm kind of, I go with the very basics and I, I mix in what I need for my individual horses at home. And, and that's what I do. I, I go with a good vitamin and mineral supplement. I add a little bit of salt. Um, I use a vitamin supplement, mineral supplement that's based on the hays that are grown in my region. Because I use grass hay and some alfalfa hay that comes from this part of the world where I live. And so I have a mineral balanced mix that matches that. And then I have added now alfalfa pellets, the little guys. Uh, I throw in a tiny bit of rice bran because one guy is a little hard keeper. Um, and then I do grass pellets. And then they get their herbs and plenty of water on that. And that's, that's me. I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty uncomplicated gal in that regard. I don't do much of anything in the way of grains or those heating foods. I see grain is very hot. And my guys just, they don't need it. So I, I don't feed it, so. Um, I, I only do whole food with my horses. And I wanna point out that, and this is a study from Australia, which was really interesting. Processed feed reduces the amount of saliva that a horse produces. Saliva is the source of bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is what the body will use to neutralize or buffer the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So when we feed a processed feed, we are literally reducing bicarbonate. Interesting. Yeah. Before so, you guys get too far off of this, I do remember that way back in the chat, someone asked about the connection between sugar and ulcers. Um, and I know Gloria, this is semi-related, also brought up calcium. Um, and there is a pretty good calcium content in alfalfa. Um, yeah. So the sugar question. Right, well, sugar from our Chinese medicine perspective is heating. Um, it causes an interior condition of dampness. Remember we talked about something's too dry, we moisten it, if something's too wet, we dry it up. Um, too, much, too much dampness is not good for our spleen. <laughs> so this takes us back to the digestive function of the spleen. Spleen and pancreas are friends. Insulin, pancreas, sugar metabolism. So there's that kind of an interesting circulation. And so I am a little, I'm a lower sugar person uh, myself. Um, just in feeding my animals and feeding myself. I know that, you know, with COVID, I've been a little more isolated, less said, less mobile, no, less mobility around. And yeah, I put on a little bit of COVID weight gain. So I'm glad you can only see me from here up. <laughs> but I, I kind of made the comment, I think we got to dial down the carbs here and some of the sugars. <laughs> so I'm, I'm back on the low sugar food myself. But um, if I could backtrack for just a second to something you had said about the reduce saliva production. We talked about, we didn't really talk about it, but we have that balance of yin and yang. And so saliva is a yin substance. It's a body fluid. And it's interesting that that damps down that excessive heat generated by the stomach. We see gastric ulcers, stomach ulcers, those kinds of conditions. They don't have enough yin in their stomach and they've got too much yang. It's that excess 
not being quelled by the moisture. So we look at nurturing that stomach yin with ulcer treatment. If that's a, I know it's a little bit out there in Chinese medicine land, but um, so we're supplementing the yin of the stomach, and that has to do with that moisture-laden production of the saliva that's mixing with that food as it travels into the stomach. So it's a, we need to nourish the yin of the stomach, stomach yin. That's the way I heard, that's what I interpret from what you said about the, the saliva, salivary content going on. Yeah, I just find it so interesting that when horses eat grass and eat hay, their saliva produces a tremendous amount of bicarbonate. Which yeah. is, it, it may be one of the reasons when wild horses, you know, they, they tend not to have ulcer problems until they get captured. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, if you let horses eat 20 hours a day, forage, pasture, they on average tend to have less gastric issues. And they're moving their big muscle groups. Yeah, and, and they're walking, they're walking and they eat. They walk and they eat, they walk and they eat, they walk and they eat. They don't just stand in one place and graze. I think that's one of the problems with confining horses to small um, paddocks, which makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. But I, I keep six horses on. Back into the muscle almost a hundred acres and they are constantly moving, moving, wow. eating, moving, eating, moving, eating, moving, eating. And, yeah. and that's, that makes a huge difference in, in their chi and their shen. <laughs> and, and that's, so that brings the spleen back into the digestive process yeah. because by moving those muscles, you're enhancing spleen and spleen is helping with that digestion function. Emily? Okay. Um, oh, bicarbonate question. I see yeah. that one. Bicarbonate and baking soda, like how some people take baking soda to reduce the acidic environment? Okay, well, it, baking soda is, is dicey only because it caused a great deal of problem on the track, oh, about a decade ago. Um, horse uh, trainers were making what they called a milkshake with bicarbonate, which they thought would help reduce lactic acid. What really happened was that, that the reason horses were doing better was that it increased lactic acid, but that's sort of another topic. Um, I, I don't give baking soda. Um, I, I am much more into the horse uh, eating uh, real food and so they don't need baking soda. But uh, I don't know, Gloria, have you ever fed baking soda? No, I, um, people take it, but I think what it does, especially with my human patients who have got like acid reflux and that sort of yeah. thing, um, I think it's just sort of a temporary lowering of the stomach acid. And then it, the stomach says, whoa, our stomach acid is too low. We better crank up production again. So I, you know, if you're in trouble and you need a quick, you need a quick relief right then and there, yeah, I think it's okay to do, just take a little swig yourself. But I think as long-term dosing, I think you're kind of getting on a cycle of, uh, it's like, it's only a Band-Aid. It doesn't really fix anything. It's just, it gives you a temporary relief um, from, from, that, from that whole process of, you know, generating stomach acid. You know, that's really interesting because a um, meprazol, gastroguard, ulcerguard, it has an action in the body where once you stop it, it, the body actually increases the amount of stomach acid it produces once it's off of a meprazole. That's why we keep having these rebound uh, stomach ulcer issues with horses. While they're on a meprazole, great. As soon as you stop it, bang, they've got an ulcer again. But that's because the body is responding to the fact that you've cut off stomach acid production for 30 days or 45 days or two weeks. And the body goes, wait, 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 we need more acid. And so then you're just in this endless cycle. 
You know, we see that with a lot of pharmaceutical medications. You know, the anti, the statin drugs, the cholesterol drugs are very similar. Blood pressure medication is a similar thing. People go off their meds abruptly, you know, and suddenly their cholesterol is spiking. It's almost like you've been sitting on me too long. Woohoo! You know, you're taking the lid off and I'm going to act out and bounce around the house and I'm going to raise your cholesterol and raise your blood pressure. It's, it's, it's almost like just putting a little bit of a lid on something. And once you take that lid off, it's, you know, out of control again. Uh, so that's, that's super interesting too. We know that with our human patients and prolonged use of omeprazole, we know is leading women to osteoporosis yeah. and they're even talking about some dementias, uh, early dementia coming on with prolonged use of like Prilosec and the purple pill and, um, you know, omeprazole. So I try to wean my human patients off those types of medications too and put them on some herbs that can do a similar effect but don't have that, um, that, that negative side effect. And diet and herbs are a perfect way to do that. Um, the other thing I noticed with horses on omeprazole for long periods of time have very loose stools of almost all the time. And so you can kind of tell who's been taking it by just looking around in their stall. Um, so we do know too that, at least with human population, the prolonged use of those uh, medications also leads to more gastric infections in the lower GI tract. And we know that it blocks your absorption of minerals and uh -huh. You, you just took the word right out of my mouth. We know in horses it blocks calcium and magnesium. Those so, are really important minerals. You know, and, and one wonders about, you know, fractures and bone injuries to horses, performance yeah. horses, been, you know, routinely just on a meprazole because everybody in the barn is taking it, they get it too. And so it's, a, it's kind of a dangerous slope, you know, in a way. Well, I, I want to thank Kathy, who's <laughs> we lost, who's actually working a horse show at the moment in North Carolina. So maybe she got pulled away by clients. And Gloria, it is such an honor to meet you. I, I would love to spend more time with you. I hope you come to Florida. I hope you come to Wellington this coming winter. Hopefully there will be a Wellington. And I would love to meet you. Oh, let's just make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's a deal. And if oh, you need to get whole Gloria, wholehorse.com dot, whole is her website. And um, that's she's got a phone number there and an email. And there's an email note in the chat. Great. Thank you for doing that. That's really, that's really great. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks, well, everybody. Real joy. So thanks for letting me talk with you guys. Well, you, you brought a lot of sunshine to us, so thank you. <laughs>